Good afternoon, Aditya Ji, and warm welcome to you on behalf of APAC News Network uh, to this APAC dialogue uh, discussion. Uh, uh, so just for our audience here, uh, we have uh, Aditya Berlia uh, of, of APJ Star University here, and uh, we would like to talk upon the uh, aspects of technology deployment in higher education and specifically in uh, APJ Star uh, today. So my first question uh, to you is uh, with the uh, national, uh, the new education policy, uh, the NEP uh, there in place, what are the technology provisions that sort of have been mandated for universities uh, to adopt or deploy? And what will be the use cases of some of these technology deployments? Uh, thank you so much for having me uh, on your uh, uh, platform, Rajneesh Ji, and it's a fantastic question. I think, uh, let me sort of start by, uh, you know, looking at how technology deployments have uh, traditionally happened in higher education, a little bit about COVID, and then, of course, uh, catching us up to the NEP. If you look at the last 20, 30 years, you've seen uh, higher education all across the world slowly marching towards technology from two aspects. First, uh, the back end, which includes your 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 back end LMSs, ERP, student record management, uh, all of those, and on the second hand, you're seeing a lot on the front end, which is primarily uh, you know virtual experiences, learning management systems, face to face, parent portals, all of that, right? And so over time, you've uh, you've had a large number of universities, colleges all across the world go into certain standards. And, and certain pieces of open source and proprietary software, which have sort of gained dominance over this time. We've also seen a lot of, uh, you know, uh, new startups and all try to enter the market. And I, and I always tell them, you know, that never come in saying that you're going to revolutionize higher education because that doesn't happen in a day. Higher education intrinsically is, is you know, as a colleague of mine uh, recently said, is like a giant oil tanker. It takes time to move it around. And, the, and therefore, historically, technology adoption has been slower than what you would expect uh, uh, from comparable industries or, or organizations. Now, COVID-19, of course, changed that dramatically. Now, we, we at APJ Education, we have 16 colleges and the university in, in, in higher education. We also have a large number of schools. We've been really focused on uh, uh, you know, deploying technology well beyond uh, what has been available in the market in India and in the Asian subcontinent. But, uh, you know, COVID-19 sort of forced everybody to try to catch up. And, and I think that sort of led to an enormous amount of innovation, a lot of mental rethinking of how technology can be used, not just in terms of the universities and higher education, but also from the perspective of students, parents, and regulators. Now, the NEP, uh, is a fundamental revolution. I have said it, you know, India's education system has been in the dark ages for the last 20, 30 years. We have put band-aid after band-aid. Uh, a lot of what the NEP has done, has, has proposed is we've been advocating for decades and we have put into practice in our university. Um, and in fact, we were, we were very heartened that most people who see the NEP see it as us being far ahead of it already. But this also means you're going to come up with certain challenges, particularly when it comes to technology and a lot of opportunities uh, for uh, for new companies and startups in this space. Primarily, what you have is a complete rejigging of the entire education uh, system when it comes to credit, student records, backend systems, learning management, classroom scheduling, everything. And so pretty much all your systems and software that you have been using for the last 10, 15 years, all the established players, all the standardized systems all go out the window. So first is a one-time great reset where everybody to enable themselves to get to the NEP. We are a little bit fortunate. A lot of what we do has been in-house and because we were far ahead of the NEP in terms of flexibility, we are already compliant day one, but a lot of other people will have to re-go through that entire sessions where they have to make sure that their systems are flexible because at the end of the day that is what nep does it focuses on the students and demands flexibility from higher education institutions but the second part uh nep is not going to be implemented 
in in one day or one year although it is a brilliant framework and, and a wonderful policy it's going to take two to three years we are going to take two steps forward one step back perhaps maybe a step right maybe a step left and that's going to cause a lot of change so i think one of the, one of the biggest challenges that higher education inst institutions will face is that whatever new system they put into place uh, within three to six months you are going to see a consistent need for change and this is a new in india we've seen it in everything in the implementation of gst we see it in terms of tax circulars and systems that come all the time but in higher education you rarely see this level of change happening on a year-to-year -year basis and i think the great opportunity uh, from from a back end and uh, uh, a systems perspective will come from this in the nep from the front end i think COVID plus nep uh, will is is a game changer. On one hand, we have spent a lot of time uh, pushing the edge and trying what can and cannot be done in education. But on the other hand, the NEP came six months in COVID. So the regulators have managed to encompass a lot of the ideas that they learned in COVID into the NEP itself. You know, a lot more flexibility on, on blended classrooms, a lot more flexibility on virtual learning. And I think post COVID-19, a certain expectation will be there from students and a certain expectation will be there from regulators in how technology, particularly the front end side, uh, will behave and, and how students will consume, uh, particularly those courses which, which have thrived in, in an online fashion. So I think huge amount of change. I call it the great reset. Uh, I think the NEP plus COVID is a great time for all of this to get re uh, redone and a tremendous opportunities uh, for old companies and startups alike to relook at the market and come out with new products and services. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you talked about the reset and you gave the exact analogy about the higher education being like a slow cruiser to move and uh, not much technology advancement has happened in the last few decades. Whereas uh, the COVID and the NEP sort of uh, necessitated many of the changes. Now, uh, from the APJ perspective, I'll come. Uh, one very important part is uh, there are always three, if I may say, important stakeholders in the whole higher education ecosystem the institutions themselves, the students, and the teachers. Now, this reset is happening, uh, uh, sort of technology intervention. Uh, how has APJ played a role so that all these three stakeholders? are on the same bandwidth or in synchronization, if I may say, because otherwise uh, in a blended learning, things will not happen. So how have you managed this synchronization? So as you see, we were very lucky. You know, uh, we have been uh, pioneers in the country and even in Asia in, in the use of technology. You know, in the 1990s, we made uh, programming mandatory for every student who graduates from our schools. In the early 2000s, we had moved to full virtualization using at that time VMware and all the other technologies. By 2008, we had discovered cloud computing. Uh, at that time, no one in India really even was talking about cloud, cloud computing. By 2010, uh, 2011, uh, you know, Amazon declared us the only person, um, our organization in the, uh, in perhaps even the continent, which is 100% in the cloud. And during that time, you know, being uh, being and putting technology first is something that our teachers and our students were used to. So, you know, within two days of the lockdown, we were fully online. Our courses were online. Everything was virtual. Now, I say that because we were it. It was a luxury. You know, many well-known institutions who are you know, at least on public, they say we are so technology enriched. Didn't couldn't do exams for three months, six months, one year after the lockdown. They could barely do online classes. They, uh, they moved uh, to distance education rather than virtual education. So we were very, very lucky. You know, we had the infrastructure, we had the training and our people were ready. But even then it was horribly difficult. I don't think I slept <laughs> for three months during that time. Uh, for us, it was a combination of two, three things which we tried. One, clearly identifying uh, who are who are at risk, and and that includes people, uh, 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 students from from perhaps economically weaker sections, or students uh, who were uh, stranded, who had to run home because we have students from all across the world in our higher education institutions uh, who might have problems with internet access. Uh, similarly, for teachers, 
So one, we, we really try to focus on them. In many cases, we, we bought laptops, we, we bought devices, we started an in-device sharing system. We upgraded our uh, technology infrastructure to be able to use peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication as well, to really try to drive that how do we reach the last person. Second, and I think this is hats off to our great and brilliant faculty members. You know, pre-COVID-19, it would take a very senior professor, maybe two assistants, a computer to run a course. But very quickly, in about a week or two, uh, they got fairly comfortable in being able to use a phone or, or a, a laptop to teach. And I think that gave them a certain level of confidence that, look, I can do this. There was always, you know, we had a five-year technology adoption plan where blended learning and virtual education was front and center. But what we imagined was, was professors sitting in professional studios with you know, multiple cameras and all, and really being able to conduct these beautiful, uh, well-designed courses. And instead, they were on a mobile phone. <laughs> and the other students were on a mobile phone. And then they were trying to interact. So I think the second part is that you know uh, we had great trained faculty, and they were able to get the confidence quickly. But third, also. Well, you know, it was our, our we had teams and faculty members that quickly tried to understand what's working, what's not, what's what's best practices. Uh, we had a tech team both in India and abroad who was constantly developing new plugins and 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 new changes, tweaking our curriculum as well to resuit an an online system. And you know, I'm going to be honest. I think a lot of it worked. A, a lot of it doesn't work. And I think that learning is something that that, that we're taking into a post COVID-19 era is to really see that what is the limits of what technology can do currently and, and know where you still need structured physical uh, systems. Uh, but I think we can only grow from there. Um, the only thing for us also, which I'll say, which was perhaps a little bit different, is that the uh, Although we give about 25-30% of scholarships, the vast majority of our students, you know, are, uh, you know, usually have done very well in school, right? So they are very smart. Our, our faculty is very carefully chosen. We get, you know, thousand applications. We we might choose one faculty. So we do have a little bit of an elite group of students and faculty, and that made our job a lot easier. Uh, in comparison to another college which or a government institution which may not have the luxury of having very good students and very good faculty, uh, getting them trained, getting them familiar, uh, getting them to start to use things was, I think, a lot easier for us than what it will be and has been for a lot of other institutions in the country. And, and you know, for that, I'm grateful and I am very empathetic to all those who have been struggling with this. So while this is uh, one differentiator, definitely uh, for APJ, otherwise technology wise, if we look ahead and blended learning is here to stay, even if uh, the impact of the pandemic reduces, things normalizes, I don't think we will have full physical classes like earlier in the immediate future. So in this blended learning concept, other than uh, the quality of students and faculties that you mentioned, what will you highlight as APJ's unique differentiators? I think a lack of ego. I think a lot of a lot of um, you know a lot of institutions get uh, get into this ego that if it's only created by us, it's it's worth creating. And you know, so so we really believe in standing on the shoulders of uh, of giants. If you're going to teach a great computer science curriculum, or you're going to teach a great English curriculum, you're going to pick the books of the best. And so, so part of, of, of what, what we're able to do is to quickly learn from our own mistakes and quickly adopt the best practices of everybody else, including content. And so when we look at blended learning, we are creating content all the time. Our faculty are creating content all the time, but they're not reinventing the wheel. They are fundamentally using great content that is out there, uh, which has been paid by brilliant world-class faculty and bringing it into the classroom and really seeing where do we add value to it. I think that's going to be the future uh, because, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, I was certainly one of those people, you know, 10, 15 years ago said, if you only got, give access to all this education to students, you know, it will solve the world education crisis. And that didn't happen. It's because people need structure. That's what we are there for. And because we don't have an ego uh, about it, we are able to bring in the best for our students as and when they need it. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, the other area that I'd like to understand uh, is in terms of, you mentioned about uh, the differentiators, but uh, 
if we look at uh, going ahead uh, and uh, um, and earlier also what you mentioned in terms of technology, APG has always been ahead. You some of the examples you uh, you were in cloud since two thousand eight. You were saying and even early part of two thousands you virtualized. So uh, makes uh, that means that you have been working with different kind of technology providers. Uh, be it uh, the OEMs or the cloud providers or system integrators. So uh, how have those relations evolved over the time, specifically in the last one and a half years, uh, the pandemic times, I'm sure some of the SLAs would have drastically changed and things because you are moving to that. So how are the relation with the technology providers changed over the years? So you see, you know, I you know, there was you know, one of the reasons why we went into the cloud was we were very upset with the uh, with the ecosystem that was in India when it came to technology. There was a lot of unethical practices uh, by some of the largest uh, uh, companies. I won't name them. Uh, you, you 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 know the horror stories of what you know. It it was more of a, a extortionary racket than really coming in and adding value. I think what has changed in the last five to 10 years, one, I think a lot of the larger companies have understood this and they have mended and changed their ways. And put in the last two to three years, I think they've gotten a lot better at being supportive to higher education in India, uh, rather than seeing it as a koi bag or a sheep that they can, you know, halal like a bakra and then use uh, to, to pump up their profits. I think that has changed. I think the options that higher education institutions have there's a lot more uh, new age companies who have very different business models, who have very different systems of sales and management, which have come in. So a lot more options have come in the market and that's created real competition for the first time. Uh, I think also, you know, those who have been able to deliver pre pandemic delivered during pandemic and those who were, uh, you know, talking a good talk, but couldn't deliver, they could not deliver uh, uh, during the pandemic. And just as, I, I always say there's a lot of education institutions which discovered they weren't doing really great things. Uh, and it's really sad. Uh, a lot of technology companies also realized they weren't doing any great things. And and that's sad. So I'm hoping post pandemic, there is a more, um, I would say, a nuanced understanding of what technology can and cannot do. And I certainly think OEMs and uh, system integrators and providers have gained a lot of experience uh, during this time. I think, um, you know, I've seen so many of them step up, uh, have really spent nights and nights really figuring out things, going well beyond what, what they, their, their capabilities have been. And I think that that has really built the ecosystem. So I'm very excited to see how these new capabilities that have been built over uh, will, will really support uh, higher education going forward. So, I mean, I think it's a mixed bag, but I, but I think it's been a crucible. And so those who have lasted post COVID-19, those who have thrived, have become more ethical, stronger, uh, and are poised to do so much more. Okay, and uh, another area I'd uh, like to understand is uh, if we look at uh, from an APJ perspective, uh, expansion uh, and how much technology uh, will play a role in helping APJ uh, in further expansion. And I'll use two words. One is expansion. Uh, that might be geographically and uh, covering more students in a pan-India or outside India role. How much uh, technology will help there? And two, if I say uh, your uh, contribution towards democratization of education, uh, making it affordable to a larger uh, ecosystem of students, again, in a pan-India environment, what are your plans and what role uh, technology can play in helping you manage, achieve those plans. And so we are a technology first um, uh, a group. We have a large technical team internally, uh, which which in many ways is well beyond what the market is offering right now uh, in a lot of what we do. Uh, we have great connections with brilliant vendors and system integrators who support us and any expansion plans that we have. And I think COVID-19 has, has, has really told us that we need to be much more aggressive uh, I think we fell into this lull that uh, as a nonprofit, our mission 
uh, was not to expand as much as to deliver great quality in, in the limited we have. But we realized that, you know, other people weren't doing it. And I think so we so we now have a duty to start expanding more aggressively all across the country and maybe even the world. And the only thing that's going to support that from a foundational perspective is technology in every bit part of it. So, I mean, that's a very easy answer for me. I think in terms of uh, growing more and affordable, I think what we are learning is a lot more scale. And I think there's there's a lot of three, four experiments which 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 we're doing on, on how to reach students. Uh, we have a couple of schools which were designed towards rural education and are in rural areas, although over the years, you know, those rural areas become very urban areas. But uh, but we are looking at, at, at how we can really find large scale models that really deliver for the students of India. You know, one of the things for, for me, which has been a very sad experience, uh, uh, we've seen during this time, they're seeing so much media coverage about this is what private schools are doing. This is what this is doing. This is what this is doing. But, you know, there's a very little uh, analysis on what's happening to millions and millions, tens of millions of students who are supposed to be attending government schools and colleges. And, you know, they have not been able to, despite their best efforts, you know, it's not that they're standing still. They're really trying to be able to bridge that gap, provide a virtual education, really go forward. And so for us, it's, it's, it's not just what we can do, but how we can help. Uh, there are a bunch of initiatives. You know, unfortunately, I can't talk to uh, about them right now, but you will see them announced in the next 30, 60 days, where we are working to see how can we help the ecosystem grow. Because we can't help everybody, but if we can start creating, supporting, and helping all those wonderful individuals out there, the wonderful governments, the wonderful organizations who are making a difference in the lives of students, if we can support them, I think we can truly get this impact to uh, to be done at a much larger scale and certainly uh, something that is much more affordable. Okay. And uh, another thing, first answer you talked upon that uh, from an APJ perspective, we were already well prepared even when the NEP came uh, because you had adopted some of those changes. I'll specifically mention about the curricula and uh, the academic curricula in most of higher education in India. One big lacuna has been since our uh, focus is so much on by rote learning that uh, the, this industry academia uh, synchronization is all often missing. And so industry always feels that uh, the students that come out are not really industry ready. So in terms of the industry academia collaboration, uh, what has been the role played uh, by APJ? And obviously, as you mentioned, technology has always been your cornerstone. So uh, how have you breached this industry academia collaboration? And you for, for us, uh, you know, if you look at, so our our curriculum is far ahead, what would the NEP ask, right? If you look at our university students, full credit system, they choose their own schedule. Every every schedule is personalized. They choose any class. Any student can can take any course they want. So if you aren't restricted by the degree. If, if, if as a first year student, you want to take a PhD level course, please take it. It's entirely up to you, right? So one is to have very open-ended academic systems which are modern, which are robust, and which can work for students day one. They're expensive. They are difficult to provide, which is why most colleges and universities can't do it. But, you know, we had a commitment to, to have that level of flexibility for our students, and we were able to at least, to a large extent, try to deliver it to them. With regards to industry, every single one of our courses is designed and signed off by an industry board. And there are heads of HR, CEOs, entrepreneurs on those to really look at our curriculum and to see that, look, uh, is this what we want? Is this what we need? And how do we do it? And we use something called mark to market system where a faculty member has the right to change the curriculum every day, every week to change to what, what uh, what's happening in, in industry. You know, we have colleges and universities in India who will change their curriculum once in 10 years. We do it every week. Obviously, there's, a, there's an academic board and a study board and an industry board which sort of makes sure it doesn't go crazy. But, but, but the idea is that, that if we allow faculty members of freedom to connect to industry and change the curriculum. And the last part is really research. And you know, you, you, if you just mark yourself to industry, it doesn't work because industry themselves don't know what's going on. 
changing too fast. So what we work is with a lot of industries to have very forward-looking uh, research, you know, especially in places like uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, mass communications. All we have very, very good people who are from industry. Our deans are from industry, and they are able to really see what's going to happen five to ten years from now, so that when our students graduate, they are already ahead of the industry rather than uh, catching up to it. But I'll tell you the biggest problem that we all face uh, here today. Uh, I think a lot of institutions have started doing a very decent job in bridging industry and academia interface, certainly a lot better than what it was 10 years ago. I think one of the struggles that most universities, particularly those who are doing very in innovative things uh, have, is that the industry to parent interface is missing. And so what tends to happen is that you have very good courses, which are super industry ready, which have been designed by industry, which have Know, which will definitely not just get you a great job, it'll do a career, it'll completely change your life. And no student signs up for those. We've had a couple of those in, in our university. Uh, we've, I've seen so many of these being launched. And, and because parents and students just don't understand, you have industry begging for these people. We've had you know calls and calls, can, can you send us graduates in this particular field? You've really designed a great course. And on the other hand, it's a struggle to, to convince parents and students, no, no, we, they, I want a degree which I know the name of, which is a very traditional degree versus this very naya fancy sounding degree, which I don't know, but that's the one that industry really wants. And so there is a large gap that we have to bridge where, where, where students in high school and the parents of those students actually get in, has industry immersion in class 11th and 12th. So they understand what courses to pick. They understand where the career uh, trajectory will go and, and allow innovative institutions to come up with industry courses that are fully connected and re re relevant. One of the other things which the NEP does is that it really empowers colleges and, and universities to be uh, uh, autonomous. Earlier, they were subject to a wide variety of councils and systems. Some of these councils are very good. Some of these councils are very bad. Some of these councils are very corrupt. Between those three, you don't, you're not able to change the nomenclature and the curriculum of the degree to reflect what industry really wants. So between this lack of understanding of students and parents and between the traditional degrees being, uh, being sort of controlled very closely in curriculum, that gap keeps widening. So I'm hoping one big change will happen with the NEP is at least uh, those traditional courses will become a lot more industry uh, oriented and connected just because you have that freedom to do so and you have the autonomy to do so. On the other hand, we spend a lot more time educating uh, uh, students in class 9, 10, 11, 12 on what, what are the real courses they should take? What are some of the in innovative programs? What are good career choices? that they will love to take up that really industry wants not what you know i interview so many students and I, and, and I always ask them why do you take this course and it's like you know my 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 uncle told me my my teacher told me my my best friend took it i thought it was good i read a newspaper article they haven't taken the time to really look at what's out there you know try their hand really have that comprehensive thing and i think it's it's the duty of schools as well as colleges and most importantly industry because otherwise they're just going to get the same problem that they have earlier is to go into schools and, and really ha arrive at a structured program of, of how to get these kids. Now we are trying to do that in, in our schools early on with a lot of counseling, uh, with a lot of industry exposure. Uh, but I think post NEP, the ecosystem will allow us to do this, something which was not uh, quite possible maybe three years ago even. So specifically any evangelization kind of thing, what, other than what you mentioned your schools are doing, uh, that you are uh, propagating uh, evangelization or if I may use... Well, word, you see, so, so the way I would say it, I am asking every single industry, every single HR person, CEO, chairman, any functional level to please go to your school nearby go and give a lecture on what are the jobs of the future in your company, what are the skills you are missing, what are the degrees you're looking at. And, and you know, when I was I was a chairman of CI I Delhi last year uh, and the president of, uh, of the Stanford L alumni network for, for North and East this year. And all I'm doing is propagating this one thing. Let us please, as companies, find your local schools, 
you know, post COVID, of course, and during COVID, if they have a virtual platform, it's even easier. You can do it from your home. Is explain to them these are the skills which we need in our company. These are the type of vacancies we have. These are the type of new courses and jobs and roles that exist in the real world. Because a lot of times, you know, there is that 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 translation from what's real in the world from the lens of media, from the lens of educators in the school level, from the lens of parents is very badly done right now. And so if, if the one ev evangelizing I would do is please each and every one of you uh, teach your local students, your local parents, expose them to what are the real careers out there and what are some of the brilliant degrees that perhaps, uh, you know, is not commonly known, but really needs a lot more people to be in. Okay. Uh, and the last question I'd like to ask, you mentioned about uh, you being and the Stanford alumni network. So in terms of, uh, from an APJ perspective, the collaboration with the global universities and global higher education institutions, uh, how useful they are in terms of uh, making the students really industry ready and uh, uh, overall perspective? So, so we've been doing this for a long time. You know, it's almost 75 years plus years. We have MOUs with some of the top universities all across the world. And what we found is a couple of things. First, faculty to faculty exchange and research, uh, that works really well. An MOU is just something on paper. It's only when, when faculty really start to work together that, that you actually see. And so we've had some wonderful results, uh, particularly when it comes to journals, research, cross publications, uh, and all of that. I think we've, we've had a large number of faculty from top universities visit our campus, interact with our students, and, and at least teach them the same subject from a very different perspective. Under COVID-19, it's been a lot easier. Many of them have come just online and they've given uh, you know, uh, their perspective of, uh, from their institution, often from their culture, on, on how things are going. We also have the ability for a lot of our students to transfer to, to different countries, to do semester abroads, um, you know, even we have now with the, with the advent of the new UGC norms, we are restarting a lot of our training programs, which we used to have earlier, which was stopped uh, due, due to the regulatory issues. So I think all of this is the bare essentials nowadays. I mean, I think it's, it's everybody should be doing this. There is nothing new. I think for uh, uh, for us, the the the, uh, so the new frontiers is 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 really on a few joint projects which we are working with universities uh, uh, together wherein their, their, their faculty, our faculty, our students uh, have a more regular structured interaction. Uh, we are also looking at exposure programs. For the last 10 years, we, we've been sending uh, students uh, uh, for short trips, 30 days, 60 days to, uh, to China, Singapore, US, Japan, Korea, uh, all over Europe, uh, uh, as well to really immerse them as there. I think that gives a more global perspective. Uh, 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 to our students. But, you know, no matter what you do, it never seems enough. I think, uh, uh, you know, different universities, and certainly we've tried different things, uh, we are still waiting to, to, to look at a lot more innovative options uh, to see more sustainable connections that work. And I'm hoping one of the side effects, and we've already seen some of it off this COVID-19, happening is the comfort of foreign faculty and local and uh, domestic uh, faculty to do a lot more cross teaching, especially in a blended learning model. And I think that will start a lot more sustainable approaches. We've certainly had, I think, hundreds of, uh, of foreign industry lecturers, which, you know, we used to have maybe five to 10 uh, during the same period. You have 100 plus people from all across the world come in and, you know, give those lectures uh, to our students, interact with them, answer their questions, giving them a wider exposure. So it's not just cross you, you, uh, university collaboration. When when you're able to bring in a very different industry perspective from all across the world, uh, things do improve. And uh, certainly, I hope that continues post COVID. I, I think it's one of the most uh, amazing things that happened. A uh, big side effect, uh, and I'll be very sad to see if it goes away. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, any last message you would like to give uh, in the audience? There would be many students also. Uh, so any uh, message you would like to give to the students? As well? Absolutely. I'm extraordinarily excited about what's happening in the world. There's so much change happening. And when there's change, there is the ability for people to grow. 
And I think one of the best messages that I ever got when I, when, when, when I was a young person, and it's the same message I give to everybody else, is try a lot of different things. Uh, you know, one of the things which, which our education system in India, that's one of the reasons why we rewrote our academic systems for our higher education as badly, is it tries to fix you into a particular field or a way of thinking early on. Don't fall for it. Spend your time, particularly in class 11th and 12th, really going online, taking courses, uh, you know, trying out college level programs at our university, at any other university to really get an understanding of what that entails. If you can choose better uh, uh, programs earlier on, if you can choose better career paths earlier on, things will be a lot easier. So please take the time and effort to make good decisions for your education and make and make it your personal responsibility. Don't outsource it to your parents. Don't outsource it to a counselor. Don't outsource it uh, uh, to you know your best friend. They can they should all be considered. Take their advice. Take their mentorship, but take ownership of your learning journey. And if you do that, that's something that's not going to help you. Uh, uh, not just right now. It's going to help you every day for the rest of your life. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for taking time and really appreciate uh, this very interactive discussion. Uh, and uh, thanking you again. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure being here. And thank you to a wonderful audience for staying through the entire session. Sure. Thank you.